Blessings, beloved. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him. In this video, I just want to speak about um, the fiery trial. For anybody who's watching, who's a Christian, let's look to what the Bible says. As we increase in understanding, we become aware that, or as we increase in knowledge, we become aware that as human beings, we have limitations, some capabilities, and some aptitudes. What's important to note is that the Bible says we were knit together in our mother's womb for such a time as this. That means we're altogether suitable for the walk that's ahead of us in order that we would come to Jesus Christ. But God knows in advance what you will choose. Remember that. You are knit together in your mother's womb for such a time as this. So it, it is available to every person to choose him and be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever sh should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. At this point it's important to note that God does not delight in the destruction of the wicked. And that it is God's perfect will that none perish. You see, God's perfect will, then therefore, doesn't encroach upon the will of his creatures. God's perfect will does not remove the will of his creatures. So in this we can see that God gave us free will, truly. And that we will see the end result of our choices. It is that simple. In other words, you will get what you want. You will get what you choose. Now the enemy tried to make it feel like tr during a fiery trial that you have no choice but to quit and to go back to the world. This is what they do. If you could be an expert at this, that's what they are. It's nothing to be um, expert in. But if they could be, if you, you could describe somebody as an expert in um, inclining the will or informing the will, they would be those. And so whilst everybody has a choice, what they set out to do is make presentations to influence your decision truly that's a facade what they do is present death in all of its costumes all of its facades guises and disguises that's what they do but the fiery trial is actually designed to clean us. Not that it cleans us in entirely, but it does clean. It does remove certain things from us that God doesn't want there. And so Whilst it was only the, only the sacrifice on the cross on the hill of Calvary that could actually pay for sin and reconcile us back to God, God has begun a work whilst we're walking through this earth to clean us so that his name 
would be no, even amongst his enemies. It would be known that he is the great enchanter, that he is the all-knowing one, that when he opens something, it can't be closed. When he closes it, it can't be opened. Now it's worth saying that the enemy does have power, enablement, intellect, smarts, but it's evil. It's evil wisdom, and it's not to be regarded highly. We're not to be in awe of them, the Bible says. Why? Why might one be in awe of them? One might be in awe of them because they see, they become aware that the demonic have higher um, enablements than mankind in, in ways. Greater enablements, more power, dispensation, etc., etc. You know their their faculty is greater. Comp the computation power, computing power, and um, all of that kind of stuff is greater. They're longer in the earth. They're more learned about the ins and outs of things, the expression of things, spiritual in terms of body language, how that might be expressed in body language. And so what might appear super fast or super quick to a human being in terms of a demonic response or reaction to something you might have thought or a body language you might have had, to the point where you, you learn to say, the thought occurred to me because you don't know its, or its source. Did it originate with me, or did it originate demonically? Outside of me, to me. And so, the Bible says we should respond to this by taking captive every thought that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So what they seek to do during a fiery trial is quick fire those thoughts at you. Like dealing cards real quick. Deal the deck. It is in a linear and sequential fashion, but it's just quick fire, rapid fire. So, when you're under that kind of pressure, that f rate of fire, you know, like a big Gatling gun or heavy machine gun or something, big 50 cal bullets or something, you know, you might you might feel the force and the and the rate of fire, but it's not enough to undo you. And so the Lord Jesus is glorified in this. So if we boast, we boast in Jesus and not in our own capacities or strengths, because we know that the demonic dispensation of power is greater than ours. The demonic access to power is greater than ours, in terms of our own natural power. But we're now in Christ, so that anything they throw at us falls short. It cannot destroy us, because the power in us is immeasurable. The one in us is greater than the one in the world. And we submit to this and believe this. So it's that kind of stuff where the enemy doesn't want us to become sure-footed. They have nothing now. What do they have after that? If that thought lands, if that belief lands in the heart, what have they got? They have nowhere to go. Because then they know that we know that their power falls short of Jesus's and he's in our heart. They don't want us to be sure in this because they're, that's their source of disruption. That's their disruptive access that we might be overawed by what's coming against us. But the Bible says, be not surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. And we know that the fiery trial will not be our undoing, 
because because of Jesus, not because of us, because we believe in him, not because of us. So what does the Bible say? James 1.12 Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Under fire. Quick fire round. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 1 Peter 5.10 And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Romans 12.12 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. John 16.33 I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. <laughs> but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now see that? Be constant in prayer. The enemy wants you so focused on the, on the enemy that you forget to pray. Or that you don't, you don't find the time to pray because you're focusing on this, that and the other thing. The enemy's firing at you. Pray. Pray as you walk. Pray as you walk. Praise the Lord. Be constant in prayer. Praise him. Praise his name. John 16, 33. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome. Oh, excuse me. I have overcome the world. I've said these things, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. So it says something about in our innermost parts we have peace, even though on the peripherals of our person we are experiencing tribulation. It's like a whittling, whittling away. The removal of that which is unwanted. But take heart. I have overcome the world. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. I've noticed that one of the tactics of the enemy, in order for them to manipulate you, they must first give you the impression that you need them. They, so what they do is they ingratiate themselves. It's like a worm burrowing its way in. They worm their way into households. They burrow in. Used as the object of a verb. One second, sorry. I typed in the wrong word there. Um, bring oneself, ingratiate. Bring oneself into favour with someone by flattering or trying to please them. So that's what they do. But they also try to undo you by this. For example, this, that's a big man, big man, big man. Somebody will come along and say, you're not that. What are they trying to do there? Shake the branch. It's a push-pull. They want to see have you become invested in being called big. Have you placed your heart there? Or that in your heart? So what this serves as is a wind to strengthen them. These are tradings. The enemy start trying to set up trading posts with you. He wants to start, and then come along and say the opposite. And then if you go, ooh, that's my, you go, oh, is it? Okay, I'll give you more then. And then he wants to start giving you tradings so that you would rely upon the enemy or seek him 
It's like the person who's always giving you a compliment and then suddenly those compliments stop, those encouragements. Yeah. Where do the encouragements go? Where's the love gone? First mistake, mixing encouragements with love. Although encouragements should be an attribute of love, they're not necessarily. It doesn't, then they may not be coming from a place of love. But they, they have the same appearance on the face. But they're not meant to genuinely encourage you. They're meant to undo you. They're meant to worm a way in. That's ingratiation. Bring oneself into favour with someone by flattering or trying to please them. Why is this? Because they want to become the object of your affection. They want to take your attention off of something. Maybe yourself. You see, initially you think, all right, this is encouraging me. This is good. But then, when that encouragement's removed, strategically by that person, they what they're trying to do is turn your head towards them. Like a little puppy dog looking for a pet. They want to make you their sort of slave, a slave for their affections. The Bible says that they try to exclude you from me. They pursue you, but not for good. They pursue you. might even be good to be pursued for a good reason but they exclude you they are sorry they pursue you to exclude you from God and they're always trying to encourage the wrong thing So basically what they're doing is shouting the loudest and as, and as regularly as possible. Empty vessels make the most noise. There's no love in them. They're blah, 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 blah. Every opportunity they get. Any way they, they think they can turn your head, they'll be up to it. And that's what a fiery trial is. Because the Lord is testing the genuineness of your love of him. The Lord Jesus is testing the genuineness of your love and faith by fiery trial. He's proving it actually. And tempering it and conditioning it. What does that mean? What's the conditioning aspect? Well, the conditioning aspect is that through your fiery trial, you will learn by discipline how to be unmoved by the fiery trial so that you won't be moved out of place at all by it when it comes even if it comes on upon you suddenly because you'll be learned in that thing you will have been tempered so that you're not gone cold or callous but you're controlled and protecting your heart. Do you see the difference? But the enemy is always trying to get you to become that cold callous. So as you become more learned in avoiding opening your heart streams so that they can be um, corrupted, the enemy will start to accuse, oh, you're getting callous, you see? So that you might come forward a little bit. Like, oh, you're going up against the ropes. Oh. And so that sudden instruction from somebody as human beings might actually cause us to react in a way. And then if it causes that slight reaction, then the enemy is in on top of that too. That reaction saying, oh, see, look, I knew you were going to.
trying to bend the will. Trying to make it as convincing as possible that you want him and that you want to be excluded from God and that you ultimately want death. But we don't. We want Jesus. So we stay steadfast in him, no matter what the input is in the spirit realm. What's the force? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this present age, and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. Even there, to give you an example, as I lifted my chin there to speak, the accusation was, as if I was operating in that spirit, that wrong spirit. But I wasn't operating in that spirit. But because I lifted my chin slightly, it opened up that accusation, didn't it? Do you see what I'm saying? So they speak body language. And so they use the sort of platform that they have to throw stones at the platform you're actually on. And so they say, you're us. You're standing on this square. You're ours. And then you move to the next square. No, you're ours. You're ours. And that's constant. As you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, they are telling you you're dead. Oh, you're dead. So that they're a show and tell of death. First Corinthians six eighteen, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Even there, as the point landed there, the accusation would be what? Oh, I know everything. I was just me. I said that. And that's how they operate. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is, there, are no, there is no law. Why? Because these things are harmless. Love, harmless. Joy, harmless. Peace, harmless. Patience, harmless. Kindness, harmless. Goodness, harmless. Faithfulness, harmless. Gentleness, harmless. Self-control, harmless. There's no law against harmlessness. None. That's why the enemy tries to create the facade that you can do evil things and cause no harm. And it can manifest as, as simply as a common, commonly used phrase, Asher, as long as you're not doing any harm. After somebody has told them about a sinful activity, they'll utter, Asher, ah, sure, look, as long as you're not doing any harm. But by nature of it being a sin, you're doing harm. So it's a false construct. A false equivalency. It, there's no, it's a lie. But it's formed in such a way that it seems conversational and flowy. And it seems almost like there's a genuine interest there. To see you unharmed. When they've just told you that you can partake of something harmful and not be harmed. If you're to extract that they were speaking exactly upon the activity that you're talking about. Do you see what I'm saying? 
but they've placed it so that you would. It would be unreasonable to think that they would just say random things out of the blue. So they're, they're harming, and they know they are. But they're doing so in such a way that it appears as though they're acting impartially or um, leaving things open to interpretation. But they're conditioning your, your line of thought in the way that is least resisting what you're, the position you're already in. Because they know that if they start to resist, you, you might start to resist back naturally. So they know that they have to create something to appear as the least path of resistance, or the path of least resistance. You see? So that you fl just flow into it. Whoa. Just release into it. Whoa. The blast. They speak body language and they intend to instruct you based upon what has been spoken. But it's all subliminal and psychological. And so the more the less learned they can keep you, the more dumbed down they can keep you, then the more likely it is that they can manipulate you. So they're working on likelihoods and probabilities all the time. So that means that really they can't touch you. So they're just a show and tell. They're a show and tell spell. That's what a spell is. A spell is something that's spoken of, spoken about, spoken spoken into something or someone. Cursing people. You'll never be anything. You're only a blackguard. I heard the father talking to his son outside my window one day. You're a blackguard. You'll always be a blackguard. To a little boy. Cursing them. Trying to make them submit to the spirit that they've submitted to and pass on that familial bondage, that f familial incarceration to a spiritual stronghold over the family. That's what they're doing. And then they'll try and, you know, snap up the little heartstring there. I want that person, I want them, I want them in my team, I want them. But it can be subtle, very subtle. It doesn't have to be, I want them, just a little, I want them. See how much more subtle that was? I want them. It was much more subtle. And that's the way they're working. Very subtly, very uh, reserved. But they're working through human beings. And the human beings might, might not even know because they're so gentle. Because they want to go unnoticed. But they're working there. And witches and wizards are more aware of the fact that demons are working in them. And have actually gone away to serve them. And wor they worship them. So when things hot up, it's likely that witches and wizards are coming to fight you and, and present the trial those who've signed up to it okay so we as as the church of God we expose them and their tactics 
Have no part with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Praise the Lord Jesus. If you want to be saved today, you need to put your faith in Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified, and it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. Yeah, the devil wants you like the hunter wants the deer so he can hang his head up over his door. The devil is a hunter. Make no mistake about it. So continue to seek Lord Jesus before it's too late. Blessings. Glory to the Lord in the heavenlies. He is altogether lovely. He can save you if you please. If you want to be saved, put your faith in Jesus. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified, and it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. So be saved today. Blessings, beloved.